So this week's uh, Torah portion, we're going to jump right in, is the portion of Bo. Now, the little background, just to, to, uh, to bring everyone back to where we're at, the Jewish people are experiencing, watching the 10 plagues being uh, showered upon the people of Egypt. And God comes to Moses and says to him, Bo, come to Paro. Bo, come to Paro. So we went through the locusts and the darkness and the blood and the water. We're now coming to the final, final and the most horrific of the 10 plagues, which is going to be the killing of the firstborn Egyptians. And Rashi asks, why does the word Bo El Paro used? Bo means come to Paro. Shouldn't it have said Lech, go to Paro, not come, go to Paro. Go to Paro. And Rashi answers that Moshe was filled with trepidation, fear of going to Paro. And God said to him, I'm going to come with you. Don't worry. I'm going to be there with you. But we just know that why suddenly is Moshe fear, filled with fear? He's been communicating with Paro for the past nine plagues. Every time he says to Paro, let my people go. Paro says, okay, okay. And then he, he recants after the play goes away. So what is the sudden fear that Moshe is experiencing at this time? A very good question. And why the terminal, terminology come to Paro? Rashi says, because God says, I'm coming with you. Good morning, Margaret. But do you remember in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, they say, how can you find your way home? And Dorothy is told, you have to find the wizard, but you cannot get to the wizard because he's this ominous, scary being. <laughs> and then she comes, remember the whole story? She comes and there's, there's somebody talking in a very harsh, loud, scary voice. And they move the curtain and they see there's a little man and that's the Wizard of Oz. And it's the, 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 you know, the, the irony and the humor behind it that sometimes the demons in our dreams, the ghost in the closet, the monster under the bed, <laughs> the parent comes in and kid says, mommy, there's a monster under my bed. And the mother says, show me, darling, put on the light and there's no monster. When you shine a light, the monster disappears. So God is saying to Moshe something very powerful now. We are gonna go together to Paro. And Kabul explains this wasn't like the rest of the nine, pla the nine plagues. The 10th plague was the plague where we God took Moshe, metaphorically speaking, into the heart of the demon, inside Paro, conquering Paro in every part of him. Till now, it was a plague of the blood. There was locusts. There, were, there was uh, lice. There was killing of the animals and so on, all the different plagues. But now it was going to go into the essence of the evilness of Paro and Kanko Paro himself, metaphorically speaking, the Kabbalah says, everything that Paro represented, every evil, every act, every viciousness, now was the final, final straw when we were going to open the curtain and see, reveal that Paro is nothing more than a man that God is going to come to obliterate. And this is something that also in our lives, we have a fear of a Paro. We have a fear of certain things that are holding us back. And God says, I'm with you. You can conquer this negativity, this hurdle, this obstacle, this barrier in your life, the paros that come up in our lives. And we know there are many of them. And throughout history, we've encountered horrible, terrible, cruel, vicious paros. Where are they today? Gone. We are the Jewish people. We are here. So the Torah opens up that now Moses is going with God. Bayel Parai. We're going to obliterate this which is Parai. We're going to go into the, the, the core of the paro, so to speak. 
and he will be no more. And they're getting ready now for the final push to leave the land of Egypt, to leave slavery after 210 years of misery. But I want to take a step back to something we brought up last week, where God tells Moses initially, in the initial encounter, tell Paro, you want to take the Israelites out to serve their God and bring an offering to their God for three days, like a three-day holiday. I know you have slaves, but they need a three-day holiday. And last week I brought up the question, if anybody remembers, why did God tell Moshe to lie? We all know that the end game was not to come back after three days. It was kind of like a smoke shield, a smoke screen. Now, if it's God telling Moshe to tell Paro, and God is the one that brought the plagues, and God is the one who splits the Red Sea, and God has all the miracles, does God really need to make a smoke screen? Why the subterfuge? Why say, let them go out for three days? to serve their God and give an offering. And that's how Moshe presents it every time to Paro. And every time Paro says no, no, or he says yes, but then he recants. So the commentaries have different viewpoints. Some commentaries say it doesn't look good for God and Moses to, <laughs> to, to kind of lie to Paro. It doesn't look nice. It passes, as we said in Yiddish. They should have just been saying it as it is. But another commentary says something very fascinating, or not so, but interesting, that this showed the evilness of Paro. The reason God tells Moshe to say, let us have a holiday for three days, is to show how evil Paro was. You have thousands and thousands of slaves. You can't let them have a three-day holiday to, to, to serve their God, to bring an offering to their God. Even that he didn't let. So one commentary says this shows the viciousness of Paro, that even a three-day holiday he didn't let them have. More so, going in deeper, it's called pekuach nefesh. When you have to save a life, you can tell any lie, you can desecrate any Jewish law to save a Jewish life. That's why, God forbid, Shabbos, somebody gets ill, you're allowed to call a hospital. There's an emergency, you're allowed to call 911 to save a Jewish life, to save any life for that matter. You can desecrate Shabbos. So really, you cannot say that Moshe lying to Paro is a desecration. No, he had to save his people and he was going to do it in any which way he could. And remember, he doesn't say to Paro, give us a three-day holiday and we'll come back. He doesn't say what's going to be. He says, give us a three-day holiday to to." to worship our God and bring an offering. He doesn't say, and guess what, and we'll come back after three days. He doesn't say it. It's like a little white lie, so to speak. So the commentaries say it's really okay that God tells Moshe to, to present it this way to Paro because it shows the evilness of Paro and it also shows us that throughout history, there are times when lying is necessary to save a life. Let's look through our history very quickly. Remember when Abraham is married, Sarah, there's a hunger and they have to go into Egypt, right? And Abraham tells Sarah, what does he tell Sarah? Tell them what? Tell them you're my, who remembers? Margaret, unmute yourself so we can hear you. Sister? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Jane, go ahead. Sister, why? Yeah. Why, Jane? Because if he were... Um married to her, they might kill him. Right. Because they wouldn't want to take her. Exactly. She's a married woman. They kill the husband and they bring the wife into the harem. So Avram twice, he had to do it. Twice there was he had to tell the kings Paro and then Avimelech, the Philistines. And then Yitzhak with the same story. He also followed his father's lead when he came. He said, Rebecca, Rivka is my sister. Let's fast forward. What happens with the 12 tribes when Shechem abducts Dina? They say, circumcise yourself. Then maybe we'll consider allowing Shechem to marry our sister, alluding to that. But then they kill out the whole 
nation, the whole the whole town, the whole the whole community, because they abducted Dina and violated Dina, and nobody put, put a stop to it. No one arrested the prince for this horrible crime. So they were Chayiv Misa and Levi and Shimon wipe out the Shechem, the 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 the, uh, the 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 community of Shechem. They also deceived Shechem. But why? To save their sister's life. Then Yaakov tells Lavan, remember Jacob, it's time to leave. His father-in-law doesn't want him to leave. But he leaves. He deceives his father when his father-in-law goes to do shearing in the distant pastures. He takes his whole family and he runs. And then another, two more examples. What happens with Jacob and Esau? Jacob makes believe he's Esau in front of his father. He puts on Esau's clothes and he makes believe he's Esau. And lastly, when Jacob meets up with his brother Esau, remember after many years, and Esau wants to kill him, but the whole paradigm changes. They make peace and they hug. And Esau says, come, let's live together. Jacob says, not right now, maybe at a future time but knowing that he's never going to live with his brother because it's never going to be a full peace. So we see with, throughout the Torah, there are stories of deception and lies, but for the greater good, for the greater good. So you see, it's not an exception here that Moses tells Paro, an evil dictator, a tyrant, tyrant, that he wants the people to serve for three days and he has no intention of coming back because sometimes that's what you got to do. Think of the story with the Nazis. People lied and said, I'm a Christian. People lied and said, this is my child to save a Jewish person. And Jews themselves have to lie and say, I'm a certain age or I'm, I'm, I'm not Jewish and so on and so forth. So to save a Jewish life, it's imperative at times that you sometimes have to tell a lie or a white lie. There's a story with Chaskel Besser. I don't know if you remember this a, a famous rabbi, Chaskel Besser. He was part of the claims conference. The Germans decided at one point they're going to give payment, which, uh, how do you call it, restitution to those who can prove. You proved you had property. You proved you had valuables. You owned properties in Germany. You documented it. You gave it in, and people got lots and lots of money. So Ben Gurion the prime minister of Israel had a whole debate with Menachem Begun, Begin. Menachem Begin says, why should we allow the Germans to make restitution and do repentance? They can never repent. Why should we give an illusion of repentance? And Ben-Gurion said, because money, people need money. At the end, Ben-Gurion won, and they took money for restitution for the German Jews who survived and other Jews who survived the Holocaust and were able to prove that they uh, certain things they owned and what was taken from them. And millions and millions of dollars were dispersed to Jewish families. So there was a story of a Jewish fellow who survived the concentration camps and he fabricated a tremendous amount of proof that he owned millions and millions of dollars in property. And he submitted it and they reimbursed him. What happened? The German government caught him and they arrested him and they put him into jail, awaiting trial. So the family came to Chatzkel Besser, who was the head of the claims conference, says, Rabbi Besser, you have to help us. Our father, our grandfather suffered enough. Why should we allow him to sit now in prison and the Germans are going to put him away for theft when he survived such her, her, her atrocities in Germany? So Chaska Bessa said, but you know, your father or grandfather did, did not tell the truth on the paperwork. They said, please, please. So Chaska Bessa that week was having a meeting with the ambassador of Germany. So he decided he's going to plead the case on behalf of the family. So he tells the ambassador, you got to let this Jew go. He suffered enough. So the ambassador says, but he lied. He took money that didn't belong to him for properties he never owned. So Chatz Kilbessa says, yeah, where did he learn to lie? Where did he learn to lie? He learned to lie from you. He learned to lie when you went 
and took millions of Jews and put them in the cremation and the concentration camps. They had to lie to survive. This man was seven years old when his entire family was burnt in the crematorium. He lied to survive as a seven-year-old. So he learned to lie from you. When the ambassador heard that, he gave him immunity and they released him from prison. So it's not that the Torah is condoning a lie, but you have to understand that times during difficult, strenuous, horrific moments, and you're saving a life, you lie. That's not the time to take the high road or the holy be a holy roller. That's a time you're saving a life. Moshe had to save millions of Jews from slavery. Now comes to the next point. What happens now, right? They had to, it says that after the plague of the firstborn, the next morning, they ran out of Egypt. The question is, what's with the running? If it's God who brings the plagues, God who makes the miracles, God who defines what's happening, why not leave in a relaxed manner? Why the un uncooked, right? Uncooked dough that had to go into matzah because it didn't have time to let it rise. What's with the with the running, the desperation in leaving Egypt? Why well, is it? Didn't... Go ahead, Diane, you wanted to say? They didn't trust Pharaoh. They thought he'd change his mind again. Two seconds. Okay, good. So they didn't trust. They thought power would come after them. So run, run, run. What else? What other reasoning could be behind it? Anybody have a insight? So we discussed this before that why did there need to be 10 plagues? Why didn't God just pack up the Jewish people, let my people go? Paro says, no. God says, yeah, who needs you? Let my people go and we're taking you out of Egypt. The 10 plagues, all the pomp and circumstance, but remember the concept that you could take a slave out of slavery, but can you take slavery out of the slave? You can take a person out of prison, but can you take the prisoner mentality out of the prison? When someone is, is taken prisoner uh, in, in, from, in, in, in war, POW, a prisoner of war, it's not so simple. You release them after 10 years. This therapy, this emotional, psychological distress. So it's not so simple that over 600,000 people who are for 210 years, generation after generation of slaves, okay, let's take them out and now you're free. The mentality was a slave mentality indoctrinated by the Egyptian philosophy. Didn't they say afterwards that they wanted to go back because they were Very fed good. there, they felt more comfortable? Yeah, that's the slave. Freedom, freedom wasn't right. easy. Exactly. Remember like the Stockholm Syndrome, where they say mm -hmm. the prisoner, the hostage, like has an infatuation oh. with the captor, the one who captures them. So it's not so simple to take people out of slavery and say, go, now you're going to serve one God. They had to witness 10 plagues that if you think of the 10 plagues, it encapsulated every part of the world, water, life, animals, anything and everything you could think of, hail, fire. And when they saw every time a plague lasted for one month, remember every plague lasted for the different commentaries. One says every plague lasted for one month. When they saw plague after plague, how God dominates every part of nature, every part of the universe, their mindset begins to change. Their mindset begins to change. And the Alter Rebbe and the Tanya, which is Hasidic Jewish mysticism based on Kabbalah, writes something very fascinating. It's not enough to think about something, write about something. They had to actually do it. The running, run, 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 fast, fast, fast. Run, 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 get into the car. You know, like when you tell your kids early in the morning, run, 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 we're, we're going to be late for school, we're going to be late for school. They're not really going to be late for school, but you're creating an urgency to get them to school on time, right? I do this every morning for, for, for years and years with my children. Late, quick, 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 
Put on your pants. You're going to be late for school. You're going to miss the bus. So that actually running away from Egypt was not so much that they had to run from Paro because God couldn't protect them from Paro. They had to run. They had to feel a running. They had to feel an escape happening. They had to transform their psychology, their, their mindset. So Alta Rebbe says they had to run, literally run, because they needed to run. Not so much that they were running from Paro, they were running from slavery, from the mindset of slavery. And the Alter Rebbe adds something beautiful that this generation, we're awaiting Mashiach, we're awaiting our redemption, we're not going to have to run. Because we are free people. Our mentality is a free people, free men and women. None of us feel enslaved. None of us feel we're oppressed, usually. Of course, there's oppression. So when Mashiach comes now, they're not going to have to say, run, 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 quick, quick, let's go to Israel on the wings of the eagle. Everyone will be relaxed and open to welcoming Mashiach because we're, we, our mentality is not slave mentality. 210 years, we're not enslaved. We're not doing backbreaking labor. We're not being told when to wake up, when to sleep, what to eat, what to do, if to have children, not to have children. We're not under the threat of somebody throwing our babies into the Nile River and our daughters being taken away, adopted by, by Egyptian families. So our mentality is a mentality of freedom. That's why this redemption will be a relaxed redemption. But there they had to run because they needed to run. They needed to feel that they're escaping the slave. And as and Margaret pointed out, even then there were the rabble rousers who were always complaining. Why did you take us out of Egypt? We had it better there. We're going to die in the desert. We're going to die of hunger. We're going to go die of, of, of we, we can't cross the Red Sea, and so on and so forth. So they had to run. They had to run. Does anybody have any uh, insights or questions or comments? So there's now a very uh, interesting insight to what happens. I want to bring uh, hone in on the last day that they are in Egypt. So on the 10th day of Nisan, God says to the Jewish people, anybody remember the story? What should they bring into their homes? a goat or a sheep, and tie it to the best post. Then what happens with this goat and sheep, four days later, on the 14th day of Nisan, slaughter this goat or sheep, roast it on an open fire, and then that night you're going to have your first official Passover Seder, so to speak, with Mara. And and, uh, and and the and the roasted goat, you're going to sit down and eat the goat, the, the meat. You could eat it with one family, you could eat it with two families, you could eat it together, but no thing can be left over at the end of the night. By 12 midnight, there can be nothing left over from this goat or sheep. This is what God tells the Jewish people. Why a goat or a sheep? Because this was one of the idols of the Egyptians. So by taking a goat or a sheep and tying it to the bedpost for four days, they were declaring to the Egyptian people, we don't believe in idolatry. We don't believe that your goat or your sheep is a god. So it was a chutzpah, blatant chutzpah. And that day also, God told every Jewish people to circumcise themselves, all the men and the boys. So they circumcised themselves, mitzvah number one, mitzvah number two, they ritually slaughtered the goat or the sheep, they put it, roasted it over a fire, and they ate what we call the Passover offering. Either a collectively as a group, or some families by themselves, people have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 children, they had their official Seder, midnight, the angel of death came, and whichever house did not have the blood of the sheep or the goat smeared on the doorpost, on all three sides of the doorpost inside the house. They knew that house was Jewish 
They skipped over, pass over, and all the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed that night. And in the morning, the Emtzahal Ayoyim on the 15th day, they marched, ran out of Egypt. This is the last final day. Now, the Talmud says something very fascinating. What's the story with the blood on the doorpost? Smearing it, the angel should see it and know that that house is a Jewish home. Remember we discussed how whatever happens, even sometimes it's for the benefit, there's always energy that happens, repercussions that come up later generations. Where was the last time we read about blood? Try to remember a story in the Torah portion. Blood, blood on a tunic, blood on a multicolored coat. Who remembers the story? Joseph. Very good. What, Kim, go ahead, what's the story? The story is they tore, they took a sheep to make sure, like he was dead, they faked it. They faked his death. And why sheep blood? Why sheep blood? Hmm, that's it a looks good like question. human blood. Okay. So they were showing, look what happened. They told their father, the, 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 the sons of, of, of Jacob said, look what happened to Yasef. He was attacked by a wild animal. And look at the blood all over his tunic. He's gone, right? They lied to their father. They made him believe that their, his son Joseph was now murdered by a wild animal. Really, they sold him into slavery, right? So what? So now there was still that terrible tragedy that happened then. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Even though Joseph forgave them later, it doesn't go away. What they did is still there. They committed a terrible sin against their brother. Comes God and says, there's still something here. We cannot have a complete exodus from Egypt without addressing an issue that happened among the, the children of Jacob. And you're the descendants of those children. That means it's still in the air, so to speak. It, it, the energy still exists, that negative energy. We have to now make up for that. We're gonna do two things. We're gonna circumcise, which is blood, and we're gonna take the blow, blood of the sheep, the same sheep that you said killed your brother. We're gonna take that we're going to bring that as a Passover offering, and we're going to put that blood on the three sides of the door. And what was another rule? That during the plague of the killing of the firstborn, no Jew was allowed to leave their house. They were told by Moshe, you must stay inside. You cannot be outside of your house after, by midnight, because that's when the plague is going to strike. Because it's dangerous. Remember, the house with the blood was the symbol to the angel not to go into that house. So no wandering around the streets during this plague, during this tragic event of killing the firstborn. Why? Many times there's a fight, family feud. You run away. You think I'm gonna sit here with you and listen to your insults? I'm out of here. Forget this Pesach Seder. I'm sick and tired of it. And the family member leaves. But God says, no, 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 no. You're going to work it out. No one is to leave the house. The blood of Joseph has to be addressed at this time. What happened then has to be reconciled now. There has to be atonement. There has to be unity among the family. That's the only way we're going to have a redemption here. So by bringing the whole family together in the house, saying you cannot leave. And the blood, reminding them about the blood of Joseph. The blood is now on your doorpost. Now's the time to remember this can never, ever happen again among the Jewish people. Blood may not be spilled among you. You have to stay united. Family, brothers, sisters. One people leaving Egypt. And this is the story of the blood. Because it's like cryptic and weird. It almost sounds like voodoo. Jews don't do blood. Jews don't sprinkle blood. You know, we don't go to war with blood on our faces. You know, like the warriors. If you write, watch that show, the Vikings, they smear blood, the blood, the blood. Jews are not allowed even permitted to eat, to drink the blood of an animal. It's forbidden. Blood is, is spilled. Yeah, that's why you kosher to soak out the blood of the chicken, of the, of the cow, of the beef. 
blood is not part of like our thing, but here it's, it's repentance for what happened with Joseph. Repentance, what happened with Joseph. That's the story of the blood. And now we ask, why did God say you must roast the Passover offering, which is the goat? What happens if I like boiled meat? What happens if I like if I like sautéed in the frying pan with a little bit of oil and water and vegetables? God says, no, you can only roast it on an open fire or grill. Maybe I don't like grill. Is God telling me how to cook my Passover offering? My family doesn't like grilled food <laughs> by open fire. But then again, Kabbalah explains that the roasting of the Passover offering, who would want to offer explanation? Why the necessity of roasting over an open flame? Because the, the smoke goes up to God or God. Good, good, good. We, we, this is Kabbalistic, so we got to get ballistic. I mean, Kabbalistic. Kabbalistic. <laughs> And all the blood is um, soaked out. Right, okay. okay. So when you grill, you're saying it, it's a good way of eliminating the blood, okay. What else? Um, Why so specific? You know, Jews, everything is so specific by us. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need the sciatica nerve of the beef because what happened to Jacob? <laughs> on, 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 on Pesach, we make a Hillel sandwich. <laughs> Couldn't it be a rye bread sandwich? You know what I mean? <laughs> There's so many details. <laughs> so mm. this is, it's, it's, it's a really a, 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 a question that to address through Kabbalah and Hasidus. Because sauteing, I mean, boiling is a food, you have water. Grilling of an open fire is only fire, there's no water, right? So in Kabbalah, there's two energies. There's a fire and there's water. What's the difference? Who wants to share? What's the difference between fire and water? First of all, think of a candle. Think of a flame. A flame always points upwards. Yeah. Try to turn a candle upside down. Okay. Does the flame stay down or it still goes up? And it consumes itself. Exactly. And fire consumes, separates. You put anything into a fire, boom. Boom, the paper splits, turns into ashes. Fire consumes. What's water? What's water? What's it, what are the properties of water? What happens when you pour water? It always goes down. A waterfall always flows down. Now, let's say you want the water to flow up. Like, you know, they have those beautiful things. So the water goes up, but it always comes down. Try to keep water up. It doesn't stay up. It's always going to flow down. Even though it's beautiful, it goes up and down, you know, they make these beautiful waterfalls in front of beautiful buildings and so on. So the and also water is very serene, calm. You sit down by the edge of the water and you hear the rippling of the brook. Such a beautiful sound. So real serenity. Fire. Fire, <laughs> fire burns. It's <laughs> it's consuming, it's powerful, it's overwhelming. And water is serene. So there's two energies in the world. We need both. You can't have only fire. You can't only have passion. You can't wake up in the morning and at 24 hours, you have fire, passion, and you know your whole family says, calm down, calm down, take a Xanax, whatever it's called. You need water. You need serene moments in your life. But then you need passion in your life. You can't have a passionless life. What do you believe in? What do you feel passionate about? Nothing. I don't believe in anything. I don't feel passionate about anything. So what about life? Okay. Those people are very hard to inspire because they don't feel passionate about anybody or anything. So you need both. You need fire and you need water. But sometimes before you can get into the mode of like water, you need a fire. The Jewish people were enslaved for 210 years. God wanted to, er them to eradicate, burn the parts of them that held them back, that are holding them back from being free to serve God, free to be who they're meant to be. So now the grilling on an open fire, no water, no liquid, symbolize that now you to be attain freedom, to obtain redemption, you have to burn off the negativity, leave it behind and move forward in life. 
And that's when they're able to come to the Red Sea and the water splits for them. So first you have the fire. The fire consumes, but it's necessary at times. When you have to cauterize, did I say a wound? It's a fire. And then you can put on the like the soothing ointment. So in life, we need the fire, we need the water. But now at this moment, when they're doing the Passover offering, you need to burn, burn, burn. Burn away the slavery, the slave mentality, the paro mentality, so that you could attain redemption. So you see, everything that's happened is a reason. Because when you read the story, it's like, yeah, great. They roasted goats. They ate it together. And they left Egypt. And that's the story. But there's so much more behind why God tells them to do certain things. And so many interesting things, so to speak. And by the way, in the Pesach, when the Jews went to Israel, right, they had the t first temple, the second temple, on Passover's Ola Regal, the Jews would go up to Jerusalem and everyone would bring a Pesach offering. So the Talmud tells us a very interesting thing in the laws of bringing the Passover offering later, later on. Now we don't bring a Pesach offering. What do we do? On our Seder plate, we have what we call the Zoroa, right? The Zoroa, we use a chicken neck. You don't take a shank bone. Why don't we take a shank bone? Because we don't want to show that it's a real offering. Only when the temple stands, we bring a real offering. So you bring a chicken neck, you roast a chicken neck over a fire, over your gas range or in your oven, you know, wherever you could burn it out. You peel off the skin of the chicken neck. You know what I mean by chicken neck? It's called a gargle. And you put that on your Seder plate to symbolize the offering that we brought on Passover. So the Talmud says a very interesting thing. God says to every Jew, and you shall bring a Passover offering starting from the night before they left Egypt. But think about it. Thousands of Jews had to slaughter a goat or a sheep, ritually slaughter it. How do you do it? Who's a, who's a, who's a shochet here, anybody? That means that there was millions of sheep so the Talmud derives from this a very interesting Jewish law that shliach shall adam kamaisai, that a messenger of a person is like the person themselves. So in other words, you want to give a big donation or a small donation to organization. You write out a check and you give it to the person who's asking, say here, Joe, you're collecting for Mount Sinai Hospital. Here's a check. And you have the mitzvah. You don't have to drive to the hospital and give it to the president in order to have the mitzvah. You can use a messenger. Another thing, your baby is born. He's eight days old. The mitzvah is that the father has to circumcise his son, the father or mother. So you are you going to be a circumciser? You know how? You hire a male. Male is your shliach, your messenger to do your mitzvah hanging a mezuzah on your door. You don't know how to do it. You call the rabbi, you call the rabbitson, you call your neighbor to make the bracha. You need a mezuzah on your door, but you can use a messenger to hang the mezuzah. That's what it calls doing a mitzvah through an emissary. So when thousands of Jews needed to bring a sheep or a goat to the Beit HaMikdash as an offering or the night of Passover, the rabbi said, no, no, no. Not every family needs its own goat. Families can join together. You'll slaughter your shech, your goat, or your sheep, and you eat it together. As long as you eat it together, you, it's good. One person slaughters for many people. So that's how we realize that you're allowed to use a messenger for certain mitzvahs. Now, can you use a messenger to put on tefillin? Say, you know what? I'm not in the mood. Um, Maisha, do it for me. No, no, no. The mitzvahs that have to do pertaining to your body, you have to do yourself. You can't give someone else a messenger. You eat kosher foods for me. I don't like kosher food. No. When it comes to anything to do with the bodily mitzvahs, you have to do it yourself. You can't start using messengers to keep Shabbos for you. <laughs> you keep Shabbos for me. I'm not going to be keeping Shabbos, God forbid. So mitzvahs, certain mitzvahs, you could use a messenger, something not. 
So when it came to the Passover offering, is it clear, everybody? They were allowed to use a messenger to slaughter the sheep or the goat, provided that family or those families or that community all ate the goat or sheep together. So why is it so important for us to know this law? I mean, it's cute, it's interesting, it's nice to know that you could use a messenger at times. For example, you want to betroth your son or your daughter, you, like Abraham sent Eliezer, his servant, to do the betrothal, also a messenger. Why is it so important? Can anybody think, why are we even bringing this up? And why do we learn it from this particular story in the Torah? Well, Moses is a messenger from God. Who said that? Who said that? Margaret? Brilliant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moses is a messenger from God. How is he a messenger, Margaret? Develop the point. Well, he's the one who tells the Jewish people, um, you know, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And you have to follow me because this is what God told me. Whatever. Very good. But so God also... A... Go ahead. Well, this God also speaks to individuals. I mean, we all have our own relationship, but probably at the beginning, he was modeling it for them. Very good. Yeah. And let me let me let the plot thickens. You just said Moses. Who when you think of the story of Passover, who is pivotal in the story? Well, Moses, but he's not mentioned. In the, in the Seder, he's not mentioned. Exactly. It's a little bit almost you might say insulting. How could you not mention Moses, Moses in the Haggadah even once? The simple answer is Shliach shall Adam to Maisai. Because he's not doing it, God did it through him. So in other words, a messenger in himself becomes uh, humble before the one who sends him, so to speak. As a matter of fact, you see it throughout the story how Moshe acknowledges every step of the way that he's a messenger of God. Remember when his father-in-law tells him, Moshe, you know, this is a very difficult job being a Jewish leader. You need to get assistance. You need assistant judges. You need assistance courtrooms. You need to set up many courts of law. You can't be sitting all day endlessly judging and being Judge Judy for hours and hours. You need assistance, right? So what happens? Moses brings it to God and God says, yeah, Jethro is right. Your father-in-law has a good idea. And God starts giving prophecy to the younger generation or the sages of the generation. So two young prophets, Eldad and Madab, come and they prophesize that Moses is going to die and Joshua is going to take over. So now they want to kill them. The chutzpah. You became prophets today and you're prophesizing that Moses, our Moses is going to die in the desert? Kill him. So Moshe says, no, 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 no. Why are you taking on my cause? What are you worried about? You worried about my honor? You worried about my covet? No, we want prophets. This is what we ask God for. We want every leader, every person to become a leader. A true leader makes leaders not followers. What's a true sign of leadership? That you make everybody bow to you? No. A true leader creates leaders. Leaders of goodness, leaders of justice, leaders in scholar, leaders of action, leaders in every single way. That's a true leader. That's how you know the greatness of Moshe. He never felt threatened by anybody he was happy that there were other leaders, other prophets to help them to be, to carry the burden. And that's the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Look how he made emissaries all over the world. They're all leaders, leaders of Torah, leaders of goodness, leaders in teaching, leaders in helping. That's a true leader. People say, how do I know you're not part of a cult? I said, because a cult leader indoctrinates people, makes them passive, makes them like a slave to them. They don't have their own way of thinking. That's a cult. But a true leader creates leaders who are leaders in every which way. So Moshe made leaders because you know how I, because he knew I'm an emissary of God. I do what God tells me to do. That's why he was a great leader because he realized everything he does is in the name of God. So now going back to the point, 
that it's the reason we learn out the law here in this scenario with the carbon that a man a messenger is like the person in other words if you can if i need a sheep my family needs a sheep and my neighbor's family needs a sheep for the carbon right for the passive offering we all join together because who could eat a whole sheep by themselves we get a ritual slaughterer and for our block party for the carbon pesach we get we get one sheep for everybody it's permitted to do the mitzvah be delegated because it makes more sense that way for us to do it together. But because the whole atmosphere now, acknowledging how does a person really have true redemption? How do you, what is the, uh, how do we cultivate redemption? Is how we approach who we are every moment of our lives. That we are all ambassadors of God. We have a soul. So we are ambassadors of the divine. Each one of us is like a Moshe, an ambassador of the divine. And that's why it says, Adam Elyain, Shliach shall Adam Kamaisai. Again, Shliach shall Adam Kamaisai. A, mess, a messenger of man is like himself. In other words, if I send you with my check to give to Dach, it's if I went myself. And the Kabbalah explains, what does it mean, Adam, man? Which man? Adam Elyain, almighty God the divine, that every person is an emissary of the divine, a messenger of the divine. We are all ambassadors of the divine. We all have a mission on this earth. That's the culture of redemption. To be truly free, to truly feel redemption in your life, you have to know that you are an ambassador of the divine. If you look at your life that you're an ambassador, then you know what your mission is. That's true redemption. You'll never feel free within yourself if you don't know what who you are and why you're here. But to know that you are an ambassador, a mission, uh, ambassador of the divine, an emissary of the divine, it defines everything you do. That's why when an ambassador goes into a foreign country, Israeli ambassador in Turkey, whose flag does he fly outside the embassy? An Israeli ambassador goes to Turkey. Whose flag does he fly outside of the embassy? The Israeli flag. He's an ambassador of Israel. Just because he's living in Turkey doesn't make him now a Turkish flag. And on his car, he has an Israeli flag, right? When you are an ambassador of the divine, even if you're in the United States, even if you're in Chile, even if you're in China, your flag has to be the flag of your soul, your Jewish soul. You don't become... Uh, part of the country you don't now hang up a different flag you are an ambassador of the divine wherever you are that's cultivating an atmosphere of redemption within yourself and that's why we learn it here by the exit of the egypt because it defines the whole exodus that every jew is an ambassador of the divine and that's why when god shows moshe the burning bush right and moshe comes to the burning bush and Moshe says, and God says, you know, I'm sending you to Paro to save the Jewish people. He says, me alaychi. Who am I to go? I stutter. I'm nobody. I have an older brother. I'm a poor shepherd. Who am I to go? And God says, but I'm sending you. You're not going. I'm, I'm going through you. And then he says, me. Who am I? Anoichi, God. Anoichi Hashem aleikecha. When God gives the Torah at Sinai, what does he say? I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt. God uses the same terminology. Moshe says, me, who am I? I'm God. I'm the messenger of God. That's the That's why God starts off with that line at Mount Sinai to tell the Jewish people, remember the Moshe I sent? He's Anoichi, he's me. I sent him. So it comes full circle, whichever way you look at it. So my father was a journalist for the largest Israeli daily newspaper called Yediat Achernat. So middle of the night, my father would go to New York City. There was an office where you were able to send wires. You know, the olden days they did wire, uh, tel I forgot what it was called. So all night, type of from America. So by five o'clock in the morning, 
it would it would be Israeli of uh, uh, five o'clock like their time. Seven hours later, they would get the news for the next day. That was my father, chief American correspondent. He was uh, very famous and beloved in Israel. He he knew how to write beautifully. After the Six Day War, my father wrote to the Rebbe and said that he's going wants a blessing to go to Egypt. And it was very dangerous because my father was, first of all, a Jew, and he was an American. He was a journalist, and he was the chief American corresponding for the country that just demolished the Egyptians. Uh, the told him something very, very strange. He said, when you come to Egypt, don't check into the cheapest hotel. Go to the most expensive hotel in Egypt, five, six star Two, he told my father, write a letter every day to your wife. Three, I want you to call every embassy in Egypt when you get there. Now, my father was a very close to the Rebbe. Whenever the Rebbe told him something, he never said, oh, why? It doesn't make sense. I don't have time to call every embassy. The Rebbe told him, he did. He comes to Egypt, checks into the one of the most fanciest hotels you can, journalists don't stay in six star, five star hotels. They stay, you know, you know, me, but not every day. He wrote a postcard to my mother and he goes to the concierge and he says to the concierge, I need a telephone book. Telephone book? What's a telephone book? They had no telephone book. So he had to track down every embassy. So he starts calling. He calls the Turkish embassy. He calls the Israel embassy. Well, no, there's no Israel embassy. He calls the Chinese embassy. He's calling every embassy. Hello, my name is Gershon Jacobson. I am in Egypt. How are you? And the ambassadors all said, very nice. What can I do for you? He said, no, just letting you know I'm here. And he hung up. The last embassy to call was the Canadian embassy. And he's like, the Canadian embassy? <laughs> What's the Canadian? He calls the Canadian embassy. The, em the ambassador picks up. He's drunk out of his mind because he had nothing to do all day but drink. And he says to my father, not another word. I'm coming right over. Where's your hotel? <laughs> and he comes with his limousine with the Canadian flags. And he says to my father, wow, you're the first person to call me in how many years? 10 years? And he was so excited to speak to my father. He didn't want to let him go. He says, you know what, Mr. Jacobson? I want to give you a gift. You're going to get my car, my diplomatic car for the entire visit. And so the entire visit, my father drove around in a diplomat's car. No one touched him. No one went near him. No one asked questions because it's a diplomatic car with the flags. And my father came back from Egypt. He wrote a whole series of articles about what happened after the war. And he was that year, he was like famous beyond. He was on the cover of People magazine. Every magazine in Israel, he was a picture of my father on a camel wearing one of those Arabic hats, the fezes with the... And when we went to Israel that summer, I was 12 years old, so it tells you how old I am. And everyone was coming over to my father for autographs. And one day we were on a bus. My mother made a mistake because my father refused to take buses. He only took taxis. We were on a bus and a guy comes over and says, you're a Gershon Jacobson. You're on a bus. You're not in a limousine. <laughs> and my father says to my mother, you see, I told you we should take a taxi. But anyway, um, so my father wrote. And then when my father wrote it, the Nasser said he was never in Egypt. It's a lie. So my mother pulls out all the postcards with stamp by the Egyptian embassy. And my mother said when he was there, she was having heart palpitations, but she kept getting postcards. So she knew he was safe. So the Rebbe covered every base. Just my father's ambassador story. But, wow. um, so every one of us is an ambassador. So, uh, yeah, my, uh, we have so many stories of my father. I don't have time to share them, but I thought this was connected nicely with the idea of the ambassador. Um, yeah, when Khrushchev came to New York, my father covered it, and my father went over to the limousine. Khrushchev was getting into his limo with his bodyguards, and my father, like all the journalists, like paparazzi, da, da, da. my father spoke perfect Russian. So he says to Khrushchev in Russian, I want to talk to you. So Khrushchev says, you want to talk to me? Get into the car with me. 
So my father was the only journalist who was in Khrushchev's car on his way from like the embassy to the hotel. And my father said to him, why don't you let the Jewish people go from, me, from Russia? Why, aren't you, why are you forcing them to stay in your country? My father had chutzpah, but my father always used every opportunity to promote Judaism and Torah and for this for and, and fighting for the Jewish people. But anyway, um, Khrushchev said to my father, you're the only journalist I ever met who really understands me, he tells my father. And then when he said that, my father says, so why aren't you letting the Jews out? What is this business of not allowing them freedom to travel and leave your country, go back and forth? It'll be better for you. My father yelled at him in a good way. My father had no fear. Say it the way it is, you know? So to sum up that what the Torah is telling us, that Moshe was God's emissary. That's why Moshe's name is not mentioned in the Haggadah, not as a, actually as complimentary of Moshe's, who Moshe was. Sometimes you don't say somebody, everyone knows who it really is. It draws attention more subtly to what really happened. That Moshe, above everyone, the greatest person at that time, they say, Anav Mikaladim, the humblest of all men, is not mentioned in the Haggadah, draws the attention that he is God's emissary above all. That's his success. His success was not that he's Moshe. His success was that he's Moshe, the emissary of God to save the Jewish people. That's why he's not mentioned in the Haggadah. It highlights that his whole strength is the absence of his name. When you think you're the, you're the boss and you know better and, and God sends you and says, listen, go to this and this place and do this and this. And you go, look, I know better. I'm not going to say it the way God told me to say it. I know the American people better. I'm a Yankee doodle. I know how to talk much better than God. When you think it's you going and not God sending you, it's a whole different ballgame. That's why when Eliezer comes to Rebecca's house, what does he say to the father and mother, the Suel and, his, and her mother? I am the servant of Avram. Why didn't he say, I'm Eliezer? I am Eliezer and I was sent by Abraham, my boss. No, he says, I am the servant of Avraham. He doesn't say his name. The same thing because he is the emissary of Abraham. As soon as you think you're the one, you don't, you're not an emissary. <laughs> you're not a messenger anymore. You're not a messenger. It's like if someone was challenging me on a tough mitzvah in the Torah, and I'm like, listen, between you and me, if it was up to me, I don't know if I would write this law the way it is, but it's not up to me. It's God's word. When it's God's word, we can't argue. It's God's wisdom. It's not, I wrote a novel and now you want me to change my ver verbiage because I'm not, let's say, politically correct, or it's not what you think, or it's not so nice in your opinion. When it says God's words, we're just emissaries of God's words. I didn't write the book. <laughs> Moshe is not in the Haggadah, but he really is in the Haggadah. Because the whole Haggadah is Moshe. We don't need to be told. You sit down at the table, the most delicious food. It's nice to compliment mommy, but let's face it. Mommy is the Shabbos table. Mommy is the food. <laughs> I always tell my kids, you don't have to point it out. Everyone knows who I am at the table. You don't have to say, oh, my mother's such a great cook. They all know that the mother runs the house. They don't have to point it out. <laughs> so that's what it is. So it means, and so summing it up, we are all ambassadors of the divine. Why? Because it says, Shliach shall Adam kamaisai. The messenger of man is like God, is like him. Who's Adam? The divine soul. We are all messengers of God. We're all Moses in this world. And we have to cultivate that attitude. That brings us personal redemption and communal redemption. Because that's really what frees you when you know you're an ambassador of the divine, then you never have to worry. God sent you here. You've got something you got to do. So never question your existence or your ability to be free.
Yeah. One more second, just for the ending. The ending is when you when you free a people, when Lincoln freed the slaves, right? What was his talk at this? What was his talk about? What did Lincoln talk about when he freed the slaves? Martin Luther King, what did he talk about? They talk about freedom, right? Uh, sure, sure. Jane, go ahead. Oh, I just said equality. That's what they equality. use. Freedom, equality. Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address, I wrote down another example. Let's see what else I wrote about. One more thing. John F. Kennedy spoke about freedom. Always Abraham Lincoln. Thinking who else? What does Moshe talk about after he frees the Jewish people? And this is the clincher. We're going to end with this. What does he talk about? Anybody can think, remember, something very, very unbelievable. I'm going to read it to you. So now the Jewish people left Egypt, and this is what he says to them. And this really underscores also who we are as a people. And it will come to pass, if your son asks you tomorrow, what is this? You shall say to him with a mighty hand that the Lord take us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So when he takes the Jewish people out and he talks about that we're leaving, he doesn't say, you know, freedom is so amazing. Look what Martin Luther King has to say about it. Look what Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln has to say about it. He talks about children, about the future, about education. That our whole foundation of our lives is the future, our next generation. Transmitting the message of freedom, the one God, to the next generation. This defines the Jewish people like no one else. We're not only about gr grandiose proclamations, what is freedom, and how do we do freedom? The bottom line is how do you educate your children with the values and the morals and the ethics of God who took us out of Egypt? So Moses, at this final moment, when he's telling the Jews we're leaving, he doesn't say, you're going to be free. You're going to be free. Let's talk about what freedom really means. He says, remember one thing. I'm taking you out of Egypt. And you're going to tell your children the story. The Haggadah is all about telling the children the story. Education. The future. Because everything is based on the education of ourselves, our children, our families, our neighbors, our community. Like you have to know your history. Yes. I mean, because history repeats itself and you better be prepared. <laughs> and one more point. And Rashi asks a question. What does it mean tomorrow, Machar? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, the next day? You're going to tell your children the next day what happened? Rashi says he means there's two types of tomorrows. There's tomorrow, like Jane. Tomorrow we're going to have coffee together. But then there's a tomorrow, which means the future. There's a future. So why is it so important to say the tomorrow? Because Moshe is telling them, and we spoke about it once before, but I want to highlight it a little bit differently now. There's going to be a time that there'll be children who are going to follow your path. The children who grow up like the parents, the mother and father kept Shabbos, the children keep Shabbos, the mother and father have a Pesach Seder and send the kids to yeshiva, they're sending their kids to the yeshiva. You have the children that tomorrow, they're just like you, they're an extension, they value the moral, the ethics and values of Torah and mitzvahs, they are what you call from Jews, the parents are from, they're from, their children are from. But then there's other children of tomorrow, there are children that don't know what a Pesach Seder is. There are children that don't know what a Shabbos is. There are Jewish children who grow up don't know what a mitzvah is. There are children of tomorrow that are being brought up a whole different way for whatever reason, whether willingly or not willingly. So what he, Moshe says, does those children also have to be told, have to be educated, 
about what happened, about who we are, what we're doing, where we're going. He acknowledged the fact that there's going to be children in the future that will not necessarily look like their parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents. And we can never forget about those children. And we'll end off with this point, and that is the fifth child at the Passover Seder. There's four children at the Seder, but they're there. But the Rebbe said there's a fifth child, adult child, little child, child in concept that don't come to the Pesach Seder. Why? They don't know it's Pesach. This is the child Moshe is talking about, Machar. There's going to be a child of tomorrow, he tells the Jewish people. They too have to be brought to understand that the Almighty God took us out of Egypt and continues to take us out of Egypt every single moment of our lives. So how does a leader end off by telling everybody, the future is in your hands. Education. It's bringing it closer, bringing people closer. And never forgetting that, yeah, they may not look like you. They might, not, they might be dressed in Esau's clothes, like we discussed, why Jacob had to wear Esau's clothes. But they, too, have to be told the story of Pesach. They, too, have to be told the story of redemption and who God is, and what, why are we here in this world. That's how Moshe ends off bringing the Jewish people out of Egypt.